1970s come around. That all ended. The space frontier stopped being breached. We did other things. By the way, there was an engineering frontier that we took on. How do you make a reusable spacecraft? How do you build something in zero G, something big, like a space station? All this comes in the next 10 to 20 years. That's advancing an engineering frontier. It's not advancing a space frontier. And if I may put some of this in perspective, remember that schoolroom globe I was telling you about? Take Earth, shrink it to a schoolroom gro school globe, and ask, how far away is Mars on that scale? It's a mile away. How far away is the moon? 30 feet away. Most people get that distance wrong because in textbooks, they have to fit the moon on the same page as the Earth. So you think moon is much closer than it actually is. We've been lied to over all those years. If you drew Earth as a natural three-inch size circle on a textbook page, the moon would have to be several pages back from that. You need a fold-out to check it out. <laughs> Mars is a mile away. The moon, 30 feet away. The International Space Station Space Shuttle orbiting Earth three-eighths of an inch above its surface. That's not advancing a space frontier. Some other kind of front, not space frontier, I assert. By the way, the thickness of Earth's atmosphere on that scale, it's the thickness of the lacquer on the globe. That's how thin this air is that we breathe, that we think of as an ocean of air. It is as thin to the earth as the skin of an apple is to an apple, as the lacquer is to a schoolroom globe. So you got to love the space entrepreneurs who were taking tourists up above the atmosphere, but we're kind of telling them that that's space. And I, I look at Earth and I come to it as an astrophysicist and I see the rest of the cosmos and I say you got some more work to do on that one. Okay, keep at it, guys. Are you planning on taking a trip on a suborbital flight in the near future? Uh, I'd rather it went somewhere other than... Here's my issue with suborbital. I'm not going to get in the way, like I said. You, you got to love them. Have, have them keep at it, okay? But I have an issue with that 100-kilometer definition, right? That 62-mile... You're in space definition. My issue, it's, just a, it's, a, it's a professional issue, it's not a cultural one. It's, and we know why that, that elevation matters, because the atmosphere is so thin above you, there's still some molecules there, but it's so thin, you can see stars in broad daylight with, with the sun in the sky, okay? So the sky, the, the atmosphere is not lighting up your night sky. It is night at all times, okay? I, I, I understand that. But what it means is that the altitude where we define you for having gone into space is a function of the thickness of our atmosphere. If our atmosphere were half as thick, that number would be 50 miles. I mean, sorry, it would be 30 miles. If it was half that thickness, it'd be 15 miles. If we didn't have an atmosphere at all, you could just stand there and say you were in space. <laughs> what, kind of, what kind of argument is that? So. So I, I, have, I have issues. For me, orbit, that's a nice, for me, that's where I draw the line. And orbit is really different from suborbital, all right? There's kinetic energy going on there where coming back is an issue. Whereas if you go suborbital, you can just put out your wings and coast back down to Earth. This is something that's not always captured accurately, by the way. In the Star Trek film, where they had that drilling station where they're going to insert the, the red matter to make the planet a black hole. Don't ask. <laughs> uh, so there's a platform there hovering above the planet. And there's a fight that they're having on the platform. And one person gets punched off of the platform. And you see him fall. And what happens as he comes in contact with the atmosphere? He burns up. It's like, no! No, just the act of coming through the atmosphere doesn't burn you up. 
it's, it's, it's the speed that matters. The orbital speed, five miles per second going to zero, that energy's got to go somewhere. That's got to go somewhere. That's a whole other, you know, all other challenge of space exploration that is going suborbital. So maybe I'm going to save my money and wait for the first orbital tourist flight. I'll be first in line for that. Okay, so that's a no. That's a no. <laughs> The government, the space frontier, but I'm going to answer a question you haven't asked yet. I don't know if it's there, but I get it asked all the time. Will space entrepreneurs lead the frontier in space in, rather than NASA? The answer is no. That cannot happen. It will not happen because space is expensive. It is dangerous. The risks are unquantified. You put all three of those together, you can't say, okay, who's in? It doesn't work that way. There's no business model for a corporation to do something expensive with uncertain risks where you might die. Governments have historically taken on those first steps. When the government does it, as Spain did with Columbus, then the maps are drawn. The trade winds are established. You learn that there aren't demons at the edge of the earth that will eat your ships. You bring these back, then the investors take a look at it and say, I can now quantify the cost of this. You took the, the nation burden, took the risk, the initial risk, I will now take the quantifiable risk, and now I get my venture capitalist to make this happen. So the history of it is that they come in afterwards, not up front. And that's kind of what's going on now with private enterprise trying to gain access to low Earth orbit. In the 1960s, low Earth orbit was a frontier for the nation. It is not a frontier anymore. So sure, let private enterprise have at it, provided NASA still gets to go someplace beyond. Otherwise, we're just closing shop. 